With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. A piece of history can be yours this December. 75-year-old Sylvester Stallone is downsizing, moving into a smaller house. And as a result, he has partnered together with a large auction house to auction off a lot of the props and memorabilia from his long movie career, including memorabilia from the Rocky series and the Rambo series. If you've had your eye on one of those survival knives from the Rambo series, they're expected to go for between $20,000 and $30,000 each. The boxing gloves that he used in Rocky III, and in case you forget your sequence, that's Clubber Lang. That's Mr. T. They are expected to go for $20,000, and I'll just say I pity the fool that pays that much for them. The Rocky film and the Rambo films caught the attention of moviegoers because we all like the underdog. We instinctively pull for the guy that nobody thinks can win. We cheer like crazy when the supposed champion goes down for the count. That's certainly true on the silver screen, and it is equally true in the Bible. For tonight, we have an unsuspected hero. Nobody was afraid to leave Ehud alone with King Eglon. What harm could he possibly do? Well, this Benjamite southpaw had more up his sleeve than a left hook. He had an 18-inch dagger. And he wasn't planning to pop the king in the jaw. He plans to impale him through the bowels and empty him of a whole lot more than just his Moabite pride. I started to title my message tonight, When Lefty Stuck It to Fatty. (laughs) But I knew there'd be some snowflake listening online or to our podcast that would be offended by such a title. There's a well-loved preacher story about a young seminary student who went to preaching class and he had to write out a sermon manuscript on uh, on the assigned text. And he turned in his paper, and he got it back with a B plus. The professor asked to see him after class. He said, your, your sermon was wonderful. I've given you a B plus, however, and I want to give you a chance to turn it into an A. The only weakness in your sermon is it has a very weak title. You need to give your message a compelling, captivating title. And he said, Here, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home and retitle your message with this in mind. I want you to imagine that a group of senior adults are on the church bus driving by your church headed up to watch the leaves change in Pigeon Forge. That happens with senior adults at this time of year. And I want you to imagine that they drive by your church and, and there your sermon title is on the marquee, this Sunday's message. He said, I want you to title your sermon with such a phrase that would make those senior adults want to get off the bus and run into your church. And so the next day he turned it in with this title, there's a bomb on the bus. Well, when Lefty stuck it to fatty is certainly a more humorous title, but perhaps an unlikely savior is a more helpful one. For Ehud, the Benjamite, certainly is an unlikely savior. Commentator John Butler writes that with just Ehud and fat King Eglon in the room, Ehud was able to stab the king quickly and effectively. The description of the stabbing is gruesome, gross, and repugnant. The king must have been extremely fat. And yet, in the midst of this scene, God delivers his people. And tonight, we should be very grateful that God in mercy brings deliverance, even when that deliverance requires the gross, gruesome shedding of blood. Let's see tonight what we can learn about an unlikely Savior named Ehud, and more importantly, Let's keep our New Testament glasses on and see if we can find Jesus in this section of Judges. Three simple things I want you to notice about an unlikely Savior. First, there is a sense of repetition. In this text tonight, there is this eerie feeling that pastor has already read this story before. 
that there's a sense in which the last several Sunday nights in the book of Judges, including our overview or survey sermon, and then our first six or seven verse-by-verse studies of the book, there is a sense in which it seems like we're going over the same general theme again and again and again. Indeed, if you remember, our survey of the book of Judges was entitled, Deja Vu All Over Again. And in these lessons, I have reminded you that there is a vicious cycle that takes place in every little vignette, in every part of the narrative in the book of Judges. There is sin followed by suffering, followed by supplication, followed by salvation. They sin against God. They experience His chastisement. They call out to God for a Redeemer. And God, according to the kind intention of His will, sends a Redeemer to deliver them. There's sin and suffering and supplication and salvation. Or you may say there's disobedience, there's discipline, there's distress followed by deliverance. And this continued cycle is as predictable as the Atlanta Falcons finding ways to constantly choke in the midst of the game. For all of the interest and intrigue in this unusual story, the larger part of this story is not unusual at all. It's the common theme of the book of Judges. For in that day, you recall, there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. Now, as we examine this sense of repetition, there are just two things I want to mention. First, there is sinful disobedience. Verse 12 begins, Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. One verse after an incredible deliverance at the hand of Othniel Israel is back at their sinful ways again. With your Bibles open, you may notice that verse 12 begins in much the same way as does verse 7. Verse 7, the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 12, now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. Although these two verses are separated by 48 years, they're only distinguished by one word. And it's the word again. Verse 12 says, in essence, here we go again. Why is that? It's because after eight years of bondage in verses 7 through 10, there have been 40 years of peace, 40 years of no conflict, 40 years of no battle, 40 years of no struggle, 40 years of no war. And the people who are sinning against God in verse 12 are most likely the grandchildren of those that sinned against the Lord back in verse 7. Now, unlike what we saw in verses 5 through 11, when we know that they were intermingling, they were intermarrying, we don't know the specifics of the sin that they are committing again, but it doesn't really matter. For this vicious cycle, which David Bellman says in his commentary is more of a downward spiral than a repetitive cycle, this cycle is symbolic of our own lives, sinful disobedience. The specifics may vary from time to time, from season to season, indeed from person to person, but if we're honest, in the end, we have to testify along with the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7 that the thing that I ought not do, that's the thing that I do, and the thing that I say I will do, I end up not doing it, oh wretched man that I am. Here we are again. Have you ever been to a place of prayer and found yourself repeating the same prayer of repentance and confession that you prayed the day before, here I am, Lord, again. Maybe it wasn't even the day before. Maybe it was earlier that day. Maybe it was earlier that hour. It's me again, Lord. I've been at it again. A vicious cycle of sin. From the beginning of the examination of this unlikely Savior, this little word again calls the people of God to thank Him that He is a God of another chance. And I specifically say the God of another chance, not the God of a second chance, because if you're honest, we blew our second chance with God a long, long time ago. Israel has done evil in the Lord's sight for reasons that are not stated in this text, but that's okay because there's no good reason to disobey God for them or for us. Tonight, if you've ever found yourself saying, Lord, it's me again, 
I've done it again. I need your mercy again. I need your grace again. I've come tonight to say you're in good company with the nation of Israel and you've come to the right God because there is still a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood can lose all their guilty stains, even the guilty stains from the same guilty stains you got washed free from the day before. They're saying, Lord, it's me and I've done the same thing again. There's a sense of repetition with sinful disobedience. But now we see sovereign discipline in verse 12b down through verse 14. God moves once again and basically does the same thing that he did before. In the first narrative we saw last week, God raised up Kushan Rashavaim, the king of Mesopotamia, and came and took the nation of Israel captive. Here it's not the king of Mesopotamia, but it's the king of Moab. And I might add that his name is somewhat easier to pronounce. His name is Eglon, king of Moab. Now when I was a child, my parents used a lot of different tools for discipline. Now they did not believe in time out. My parents did not believe in counting. As far as I know, two is about as high as my daddy could count when it came to discipline. You say, preacher, what did they use? My daddy used a belt, and sometimes he would have me go out in the yard and cut a switch. My mama, on the other hand, would use whatever weapon was available. Cake batter covered spatula right on the seat of the britches. I said, stop! She took off her shoe one time at the family cemetery and gave me a whooping with a flip-flop. But what does God use? In this case, he has raised up King Eglon, the overweight and overly wicked king of Moab. And together with their Ammonite cousins and their Amalekite friends, they come to the city of Palms and they capture the people who live there. Now, the city of Palms is the city of Jericho. And they come to Jericho and they capture this remnant of God's people. I, I, I'm talking about a sense of repetition. I find it interesting that at a location that once housed one of the greatest victories in all of Israeli history, now comes a crushing defeat at Jericho. What a reminder for God's people tonight that there's not a single area of our life in which we can let down our guard and act as if we have achieved absolute and ultimate victory. God brings discipline through a wicked king. That really poses a question for us tonight. Why would God use such a wicked king? A king whose wickedness, quite frankly, surpassed the wickedness of God's people. God sees wickedness and rebellion in His people so he raises up a more wicked and more rebellious king as his hand of discipline. Why does he do that? Let me just give you two reasons. Number one, because he's a sovereign God in complete control and he can do whatever he jolly well pleases. Secondly, because the sins of God's people are always greater in God's sight than the sins of the world. I think I'll say that again. Lord, why are you letting them bring difficulty in my life? They're not even saved. That may be why. You may be experiencing difficulty in your life from an unjust boss, a rebellious child, a wicked spouse, a sinful sibling. You may say, Lord, would you get that devil off of me? Only to hear God respond and say, that's not the devil, that's me. Sovereign discipline. If you have ever felt the hard hand of God taking you out to the spiritual woodshed because of sins that you have committed, listen now, again and again and again and again and again, then you ought to understand the setting of this text. There is a sense of repetition. 
Secondly, there is a stroke of retribution. Now, these words in my outline have been chosen intentionally. It was a stroke, all right. It was a stroke in the belly with an 18-inch blade. And it was indeed retribution, retribution. For as Ehud and the oppressed people of Jericho send their tribute to wicked king Eglon, Ehud turns around and tells the king, I've got an additional piece of tribute I want to give you. It's a retribution. I've got a word from God, and what a word it was. And as lefty sticks it to fatty, I'm sorry, I can't get over that. There are a couple of things I want you to notice about this stroke of retribution. First, we see how fitting it was. In verses 15 through 23, the ugly story is unveiled. This left-handed swordsmith turned assassin does his work in some of the most deceptive ways imaginable. He comes under the pretense of bringing taxes, tribute to the king. He whispers to him that he has a private message for him and gets the king to send out all of the king's guards and all of the king's attendants. And he says, I've got a special message. It's a word from God. And Eglon rises from his throne only to find this dagger thrust into his belly. This unlikely savior, this unlikely deliverer, this unlikely judge seems to act in a lot of fairly wicked ways himself. And some people try to explain away the challenging aspects of this text as well as other passages in the Old Testament. I've even heard preachers in just the last couple of weeks, as I've tried to prepare my own heart and mind for this message, some preachers deny that this is a literal story. They, they allegorize it. They say it's just symbolic. And, and, and they say what, what Ehud gave Eglon was a two-edged sword, as in Hebrews 4.12, that the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. And that what he did is he came in and he preached to him. He preached death to self after being confronted with the sword of the Spirit. And the death that is pictured here, they say, is not a literal death, but, but that it is some kind of a spiritual or physical figurative death. But when the Bible says that this man schemed his way into the inner chamber of the king, had a hidden sword strapped to the inner part of his thigh, pulled it out and disemboweled the man and left him there for dead, do you know what I think the text means? I think it means that a left-handed deliverer was raised up by God that he made a sword and strapped it to the inside of his thigh, snuck it past the security checkpoint into the king's chamber, told the king, I've got a secret message for you that he later calls a message from God. And it was a secret, all right. Eglon would never tell a soul till the day died. You'll catch that on the way home. And before the story is over, more than 10,000 of his Moabite people lay dead, all at the hands of the people of God. Now, often when we see God work, especially through battles and even seeming cases of wholesale genocide in the pages of the Old Testament, we, we want to try to explain it away. But comments by Dr. Dale Ralph Davis, I think, are very helpful here. He writes in his commentary, try to hear this story as an Israelite who would have heard it. An Israelite, remember, who for 18 years had been oppressed and taxed to the bone under blubbery King Eglon. And then you won't be surprised, but will understand the pure enjoyment of this narrative. The point that Dr. Davis is making and that I would lay on your heart tonight is that Eglon was one of the most wicked men in the history of the world. And he led some of the most wicked people in world history. And his fate was fitting for the high crimes he had committed against God. In the very same way, in our day, when we hear about a serial rapist or murderer receiving the harshest of penalty, we feel no sympathy for the condemned man. 
We recognize that as difficult as the punishment is, the punishment fits the crime and justice has been served. Likewise, when we see divine retribution poured out against Eglon, the king of the Moabites, we should consider that our Lord is pouring out divine wrath on all who spurn His grace. And He will pour out His wrath on all who thwart His laws, and none who would ever be condemned to hell are being mistreated. The real question for this text tonight is not how could God have been so hard on Eglon? The real question is, how could God have been so good to Israel? The real question is not, God, how could you send people to hell? The real question tonight is, Lord, how could you ever allow someone like me to get into your presence, redeemed, born again, blood-bought, and reconciled to you? How could you be so good to me? Well, it's a dark story, no doubt. We will not explain it away. It is what it is, and this is the Word of God. But as we look at the terrible fate of King Eglon, we just have to say it it was right. And once again, the Lord of all the earth has done all things well. How fitting it was. Note also, obviously, how fatal it was. For the Bible says in verse 22, the handle went in after the blade, the fat closed over the blade, and he did not. One rendering says he could not draw the sword out of his belly, and the refuse came out. The King James sort of veils this a little bit and says, and the dirt came out. The refuse came out. Preacher, what does that mean? Let me say it politely. It means what you think it means. This man has been disemboweled as he rose from his throne. And verse 24 says, and when he had gone out, his servants came and looked, and behold, the doors of the roof chamber were locked. And they said he's only relieving himself in the cool room. This is a small private chamber on the roof of the palace. And because of the lack of sanitation in that day, that would often be the place, the highest part of the house, open to the exterior, that would be a place where they would often have the king's private bathroom. In older days in our country, we had an outhouse. In that day, they had an up house (laughs) up on the roof of the house. And somehow, in a way that the text does not tell us, when When this left-handed assassin slips out of the king's bathroom to make his getaway, he's able to lock the door behind him. The servants who had been dismissed come back and they, they see that the door is locked. And they say, well, I guess he's still in the bathroom. And they politely begin to wait. And they wait, and they wait, and they wait. And again, not to be crude, but after a certain length of time, they say something must be wrong. He's either not using the restroom as we had supposed, or if he is still needing to use the restroom, he must be very, very sick. And the Bible says that they are filled with anxiety, verse 25. And behold, they did not open the doors of the roof chamber. Therefore, they took the key and opened them. And behold, their master had fallen to the floor dead. The left-handed deliverer needed some time to get away. So he locked the doors and slipped away unnoticed. And when they come in what some commentators call inspired humor, they think maybe he's in there emptying his bowels. He is all right. Just not by nature. He's doing it thanks to a double-edged Israeli sword. So they walk away, leaving the king alone, thinking everything is fine. Seems like these foolish Jews have just come to pay some more of their taxes, nothing more and nothing less. But as more and more time goes by, they know something's not right, so they open the door to the chamber, and there lies their king, dead as a hammer. And his internal organs spread over the floor of that private chamber, confirm there's no need to get him to the emergency room. Call the undertaker. Somebody has come by and crushed 
the enemies of God's people. I believe I'll say that again. Somebody has come by and delivered a fatal blow to the enemy of God's people. Reckon who that might be. There's a sense of repetition. There's a stroke of retribution that leads thirdly and finally to a shadow of redemption. A shadow of redemption. Now let me be very careful here to not allegorize the Word of God. By that I mean we don't want to add symbolic meaning to every single thing where the Scripture would not have us do so. We don't want to turn the Word of God into something like the writings of C.S. Lewis or John Bunyan, but we can still see glimpses of Calvary in this bloody scene in Eglon's bathroom. From the darkness of this murder scene, there are flickers of the light of redemption, and I've left myself enough time to try to help you find Jesus in Judges. How is there a shadow, a foregleaning, just a hint of the redemption that we will find through Jesus Christ? Two things, and we're finished tonight. First, there was an uninspected device. It's that 18-inch dagger strapped to the inside of his right thigh, and nobody thought to look for it. It may interest you to know that in December of 2019, a whistleblower gave an undercover report about an operation at TSA. Those are the folks that check you and your bags when you go to get on a commercial flight. The whistleblower said that under this undercover operation, they had a 95% failure rate at finding weapons trying to be uh, 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 being allowed onto airplanes. In this undercover operation, they took 70 fake weapons and tried to get them on airplanes, and they got on the airplane 67 out of the 70 times. I'm talking about an uninspected device. Now, the whistleblower said it's because we're we're trying to trade speed for safety. The reason these devices are slipping through, we're trying to get people on the airplane, we're trying to get them to their gate in a timely manner. But the question we need to consider tonight, why did these guards and attendants let an 18-inch dagger into the king's chamber? And further, why would they let anybody at all stay alone with the king? Most likely, this is where the left-handedness of Ehud comes to bear. For you see, since most people in that day were right-handed, and by the way, most people in our day are right-handed, a right-handed person would tend to draw their sword from their left hip. So no doubt these guards and attendants had been trained to watch for the bulge or to maybe frisk down the side of the hips, especially that right hip. None of the king's men thought that defeat would come the way that it came. Barry Webb in his commentary writes that Eglon is easily deceived by Ehud, so much so that he dismisses his own bodyguard and rises from his throne to receive the message from God that Ehud offers him, totally deceived about its real nature. He has no idea that God is going to defeat the enemy of his people through this unseemly, unlikely, uninspected device. Now, I can't help but stop here and think about another means of death that nobody was actually concerned about. Indeed, the world said, cursed is the man who hangs upon a tree. But like big fat Eglon, foolishly rising from his throne, gladly desiring to move toward his own fatal death blow, I want you to look at his actions and in it and through it, See our adversary, the devil, stirring and scheming, filling the heart of Judas Iscariot, lurking in the garden, planting lies in the mouths of false witnesses against the Lord Jesus, conspiring through the mind of Herod, plotting through the ambitions of Pontius Pilate, stirring the hands of godless men to nail the Lord Jesus to the cross. Why are they doing that? Because nobody thought, Deliverance would come like that. That's because nobody apparently had thought to read their Bible. Else they would have known that the Savior would be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity, and the chastisement of our peace 
would fall upon him. And by his stripes, by his scourging, we would be healed. Nobody thought to check this message. And in so doing that day at bloody Golgotha, Satan gladly rises to bruise the heel of the Lord, not knowing God will use this device to give a death blow to crush his demonic head. An uninspected device. But the real shadow begins to emerge when we consider not only an uninspected device, but the unsuspected deliverer. Ehud, left-handed Benjamite. Who in the world is Ehud? It's doubtful unless you have studied the book of Judges in the past that you know anything about Ehud at all. And even after having studied the book of Judges, you won't know a whole lot more. He's just some left-handed would-be Zorro from the tribe of Benjamin. But the word left-handed here does not necessarily mean how we would interpret it. A Washington Post article recently confirmed, once again, that about 10% of people around the world are what we would call left-handed. That means they are dominant with their left hand when it comes to writing and working, perhaps throwing a ball. 10% of the world, in that sense, is left-handed. But that is actually not what this phrase means. R. Kent Hughes states that this phrase, left-handed, means that he was bound up in his right hand. Restricted in his right hand. This very specific word leads many commentators to conjecture that Ehud, this unlikely Savior, had some form of deformity, some kind of disability in his right hand. Now, I want you to watch this. Look in verse 15. Verse 15 says, When the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man, a man who had some kind of weakness in his right hand, a man who had some kind of deformity in his right hand, a man that had some kind of disability in his right hand. In other words, God raised up a deliverer, but it's not a deliverer that anybody else would have suspected. In fact, if you'd come on the scene right then and said, God is raising up a deliverer for you, they would have done the same thing they would later do when Samuel went out to anoint King Saul. They would have gone around town looking for the biggest and the strongest and the bravest. But God, in His great providence, raises up someone that is seen in weakness. Not a king born in a royal palace. Not a warrior born at a military compound. A simple plain, weak deliverer who looks anything but strong. See Ehud come strolling up to the palace. I'd like a word with King Eglon. They know him. Nothing to be afraid of from him. That's old weak-armed Ehud. We don't have anything to fear with Ehud. Want to be alone with the king? Sure, Go ahead. We don't think you're that much. So left alone, he goes toe-to-toe, face-to-face, and one-on-one with the ruler of wickedness. And everybody thinks that Eglon is going to be fine. But when they finally burst through the door, they find out he's as dead as dead could be. Meanwhile, Ehud's on the outskirts of town using that one good arm to blow a trumpet. And when everybody gathers around, he says, I've got good news for you. Nobody thought that I was the one that would do it. Nobody thought I would do it the way that I did it. But I've got good news. The king that we have feared, I have defeated him. You are free if you want to be free. I've won the victory. You can get on the victory with me. All you have to do, read it right here in this text, all you've got to do is come and follow me. And that is exactly what happened through the Lord Jesus Christ. When I tell you that nobody suspected Ehud would be a deliverer, when I tell you that he looked weak and fragile and frail, good Bible students ought to have the prophecy of Isaiah ringing in your ear. For we had, when we saw him, he had no stately form or majesty. And when we saw him, we thought that he was smitten and stricken of God. As for his upbringing, can any good thing come from Nazareth? As for his pedigree, we know him. Is this not the son of the carpenter? And yet through his death, burial, and glorious resurrection, he has delivered his people and says to us tonight, if you want to be free from the bondage and the oppression of sin, I've won the victory 
and you need to come and follow me. Somebody in this room tonight is trapped both in the repetitive cycle and the downward spiral of sin, suffering, supplication, and salvation. And the Lord Jesus Christ stands here tonight in great victory to tell you that if you find yourself bound in sin, deliverance can still come from an unlikely Savior. And in this case, in our case, His name is Jesus. And you can find Him in Judges. And tonight you can find Him at Emmanuel. You've been listening to the Emanuel Pulpit, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Mike Stone, Senior Pastor of Emanuel Baptist Church in Blackshear, Georgia. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, Pastor Mike is committed to walking you verse by verse through books of the Bible. We pray this message has been an encouragement to you as you seek to learn and live the Word of God. Free audio downloads of this message, as well as general contact information, are available through our website at ebchurch.net. Thanks for joining us for today's message from the Emanuel Pulpit.